when Tom Schaller is on the stage, we are like uh, in heaven. Really, Tom. Tom Schaller is uh, more than an artist. He's an architect. As an architect, he has had a long uh, professional life. He has started painting uh, uh, through his job, uh, gradually going to paintings. Then he started making uh, his life focus on paintings. And he has a lot, a lot, a lot to teach. And what makes, what makes me happy about being uh, uh, friends to Tom and about being uh, uh, one of his students is that he always keeps surprising me. He knows, he knows about it because I always tell him. He never repeats what he has done before, but he has a strong, strong style. You can understand uh, a painting was done by Tom Schaller hands as soon as you see. And when you see something very new, you also under understand it is done by his hands because his style is so strong, like only real artists from the history of art have done in their, in their artistic life. So I believe, Tom, this is not to please you, but I believe you are one of the watercolorist artists and you are one of the artists. But that better represents today uh, watercolors in the world and what is the significance, the meaning of being an artist. Uh, big uh, professionality, big personality, big technique and the humble attitude to keep doing the research. This is all, all that can be done in art field. And Tom is, doing, is teaching us to do all of that together. Now, I leave the microphone because usually uh, Tom demonstration, Tom Schaller demonstration are not only demonstration, but he's giving us a lecture about art technique about art attitudes and he will talk to you fluently and he will explain every step he will go through. Thank you Tom for being with us. Take your time before you want to start and when you want you start. Thank you people. Thank you. Grazie Emma. For Tute, for everything. It's a lot of work to put this together. Uh, sorry, I can't speak better Italian, so I'll, if I try, I'll be here for four hours. So, silly inglese. But I'm very honored to be asked here today. I love this festival, I love what it stands for. I really am grateful to Anna for everything she does. It's a lot of work. But, if you didn't show up, it wouldn't be successful. So thank you all for showing up and for being here today to watch me make a mess of my painting. <laughs> uh, as a, well, I have to... Can you hear me okay? I'll try to project for my acting lessons. Today I'm going to do a demonstration of something that um, well, I've been working on my whole life, a style of painting. But in the last two years, as we all know, a lot of us spent a lot of time at home, not traveling, and it's so great to be able to be back among friends and, peop and people that I don't know again. So I'm very pleased to meet you all, and just to be in the company of other artists is a genuine honor. And thrill for me. But uh, in the past two years, there have been many bad stories, but a few good things have happened. For me, um, I think a lot of us investigated our lives and decided which way we want to go forward and what works for us and what doesn't. I um, thought a lot about that. So I've made a lot of changes in my life. I am moving next month back to my beloved New York City. 
so I'll be able to come to Italy much more easily. Um, but in terms of art, I began to investigate what I paint, why I paint, who I paint for, what am I trying to say, do I have an artistic voice. I teach a lot of classes, I have a, an online curriculum through a terracotta company that is a, a full year in length and we talk mostly not about technique but about why do we paint? What is it that's inside all of us that makes us want to paint? I believe we all have within us an unexplored artistic voice that if we just work a little harder on looking inward rather than outward, we begin to find it and we begin to explore it and we begin to utilize it to its best advantage. I have been fascinated with imaginary subject matter my whole life. I love to paint plein air, I love to paint in the studio, but more than anything, I love to paint from my imagination. I think, I don't want to sound um, immodest, but I think my best paintings are a combination of a little bit of reality, a little bit of fantasy colliding. All of my work is a study in contrast, light versus dark, vertical versus horizontal, warm versus cool colors, but also the past, the present, the element of time, man-made elements, the natural world, as they collide and find some sort of a, a dialogue on the surface of the paper, I think is where the, the real magic of watercolor can start to happen. So anyway, the last two years, I've spent a lot of time working on that. Um, I hope you can see my sketchbook. What I decided to do today was a little bit of a, a study on those topics. So I began just to think about energies, the way different energies collide. Obviously, we have the vertical energy, the horizontal energy. It's obvious, but when we paint on or draw on a two-dimensional sheet of paper, all we have are two dimensions. You have height and you have width. That's obvious. So anything we can do to begin to imply a third dimension, depth, perspective, dimensionality, I think it's worth our time. I've begun to move beyond that a little and start to think about what about the fourth element of time, the past versus the present? How can we begin to tell those stories in our work as well? So I won't talk too much because uh, I can do that. I will uh, paint. But I want to show you my ideas first. First, I started off with the very simple notion of a vertical energy as it collides with a horizontal energy. This very basic cruciform shape. And then I began to think, well, what does that mean? What could that mean? So what I began to think about was the collisions of time or the intersection of time, which is the title of my demo painting today, the intersections of time. So I began to think of the past in a vertical uh, energy shape that connects the past to the future or the heaven to the earth, what is, what could be. And then I began to think of the horizontal energies, the present, what is, also what could be given the bounds of our human limitations. So in order to make an image out of this, I began to think of elements. Uh, in the vertical plane, primarily, I have elements of the natural world, rocks, trees, sky, some water, and also some ancient uh, elements of architecture. Um, Roman ruins, columns, etc., perhaps. And then, as they might collide with a modernist idea of a city, I've done this series called Horizontal Cities, and this is in that vein, where um, the present and the future collide with the past in different axes. So I have the past colliding with the future in this uh, horizontal versus vertical matrix. So I worked this little sketch up, and I thought, eh, there's something there. So then I began to develop it in my sketchbook, which is what I always do. 
I love to draw. I think drawing for me is the cornerstone of everything I create. Um, I think of watercolor as drawing, but you're drawing with, with shapes rather than lines. You're drawing with shapes of color and value. But I investigated my idea here, if you can see. So there's like rubble of an ancient city, perhaps. It's all imaginary. Nothing like this exists, I hope. And then I collided it with this horizontal city projected from above, interweaving elements of the past with the future. And then a third energy, the natural world, which will lead from the top of the image, top right, to the bottom left, in a diagonal. So here we have the natural world, the past man-made world, and the future man-made world all colliding into one image. To save time, I drew it. I love to draw these live on stage, but we don't have that much time, so uh, I pre-drew most of this. I, it's a little light. I hope you can see it. But after I get my idea and I sketch out the composition, then I begin to think about which colors can best uh, portray m my vision. Um, I think of paintings in a way similarly to the way I did when I was an architect thinking about buildings. It's all an element of design. I design my paintings. And that does not mean that everything is decided. Of course not. Watercolor has a mind of its own, and I think it should have a mind of its own. It's going to do what it wants to do, no matter what we think. So I like my work to be a little bit of that collision of contrast, too. By that, I mean bits of my painting are planned and a little bit in control, and lots of my paintings are loose and out of control. I love that combination when it works well. So um, I usually start with the lightest lights first. In this case, the background the sky, the beginning of the sky in a pale yellow. I think of contrast and color too. I work always in uh, complements, meaning if there's a red somewhere on the painting, there's most likely going to be a green. If there's a blue, there's going to be an orange. Um, a violet, there's going to be a yellow, etc. I am very, very fascinated with the whole idea of different types of contrast collisions within my painting. Um, when I design my paintings in my head and in my sketchbook, I have four basic principles by which I operate. The first, the foremost idea, um, is, is the concept, the intent the idea of the painting. Why did you decide to get up today and go paint as opposed to riding your bicycle or staying in bed or watching Netflix? There's something in us that makes us want to paint. We all have it. Whatever is in me is not the same as what's in you. We're all similar, but we're all very different. That's fantastic means we all have our own unique, artistic, creative DNA. I can't copy yours, and you cannot copy mine. Try as you might. That's why I'm always a bit surprised when people come up to me and say, oh, I love that painting you did. Can I copy it? Well, yeah, sure, but why would you want to do that? I don't understand that. Um, to me, that's absolutely I don't mind, but I think it's the worst way to learn. If you want to learn how to be a painter, don't look at my work. Look at your work. Look inside. You'll find the answers you need. But I'm happy to share anything I have. If I have anything useful, by all means. 
But uh, I think, I'm not going to preach to you, this is not a class, but I do think we spend, and I've done it too, a little too much time worrying about techniques and materials and how to paint, and a little too little time worrying about what to paint and why to paint. If you ask yourself, why do I paint? I think you're going to find all the answers you need as far as techniques. You'll find the techniques that work for you, for your artistic and aesthetic um, interests. Because, I mean, I'm happy to tell you every brush I buy and every paint I use, but that's great, but that might not work for you. Something else may work much better because you have a different vision as you should. Anyway, while I'm talking, I am painting the uh, background, the sky tone of this image. I've graded it from um, pale yellow into a little bit of um, permanent orange down into a violet, a, a imperial purple. My pigments are all from Daniel Smith. God bless Daniel Smith. Uh, they are, well, they're great. They're so generous, but um, also they understand artists and they understand art and they, they make their products for artists because they understand art and they understand artists. Um, I could paint without them, but I'd rather not and I don't think I would paint as well because they know how to develop pigments and products that artists really use. My brushes are a combination. Uh, primarily, they're from Oscoda. Again, a great company that understands art and understands artists. They, um, they watch artists, they're involved in what we do, and they develop brushes um, that they think will help us do what we do better. And they're right, they do. Um, I'm using an Escoda Perla series of round. Uh, these are great brushes for um, the kind of thing I'm doing now, where you might need to hold an edge, but you want it to hold a good deal of water so that it, um, you can paint a fairly large area, but you can also hold it upright and have a nice edge or a point. My other line of brushes I use is by the Neef Company out of Australia. These guys, I just got my own signature Neef brushes. A shameless plug. But they are pretty amazing. They're a series of um, synthetic mops. So they're, um, they do everything a mop does, but they also hold a beautiful point they're all very useful, but I find the, the very small ones particularly useful for calligraphy and um, line work and smaller areas where you might tend to grab a larger mop. Anyway, I feel obligated to, to mention, but uh, again, what materials you use might be very different than what I use because how you think, how you feel, how you paint may be similar to me, but it may be very different. And so what works for me may not work for you. But I can't help but think my signature brushes will be for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well. Yes, I sell my arm. It, I rent it. I rent my arm out by the hour. I'm living in New York now, so I do anything for money. <laughs> That's not true. If that were true, I would be on my yacht now. Um, oh, paper. Like all of us, I know we all love paper surfaces. I don't know that there's any single material 
that kind of, well, potentially better expresses who you are as an artist or how you want to paint rather than the material, uh, the paper surface on which you um, choose to paint. I prefer very textural paper. Oh, there's a long story behind why, but because I like sediment-based paint, the sediments collide within the surface, on the surface of the paper, and make these beautiful transitions. Um, doesn't happen as well for me when I paint on um, smoother, hot press paper, and those artists that can use Yupo, oh my goodness. If I had a hat, I would take it off. I am in awe. But uh, I have found I have no skill using Yupo. Um, what I'm using today is uh, I use um, sometimes Arches Rough. I use Baohong, the rough surface paper, a lot. I love it. It's a little tricky, but I like it. And this is on uh, Fabriano um, rough surface today, um, 300 gram, 140 pound, but always the rough surface. I much prefer it. I think I have to hurry. I'm so late, I arrived here late. The taxi dropped me off at uh, a barn full of animals. And I thought, well, wait a minute. I know watercolorists can be animals, but come on. It was, it was obviously the wrong building, and so I've been wandering around FICO trying to find this place for an hour. So I'm a little bit sweaty. This is, um, I use a flat brush for anything where I might have to hold an edge, perhaps an architectural element. So I'm starting to uh, lay in a little tone on the shade sides of the architectural elements. Uh, I have a series of flat brushes. Um, probably my favorite are these by Escoda, the Versatile series, they're great. They are synthetic, but they hold a good deal of water, but they, um, because they're synthetic, um, you're able to get a lot of these beautiful dry brush marks with them. This flat brush, if I'm honest, I bought off the street in Rome for about one or two euros, so it's not a great brush, but it works for me. This is a very cheap synthetic brush, and it allows me to get a lot of these dry brush marks, which I have come to love over the last couple of years. I was in uh, China a few years back. I never used to use flat brushes at all, but someone gave me some as a gift, and I was, of course, very grateful, but I thought privately, well, I'll never use these, I'll just give them away. Um, but in my hotel room that night, I started to play around with flat brushes and realized, wait a minute, there's a whole new thing here. So that was probably two and a half, three years ago, and my painting style has changed a great deal uh, because of that, because I started to incorporate flats along with the rounds and the mops within my, uh, within my painting practice. I think you can use too many brush marks and you can have too many techniques going on in your painting, but I also think it's a balance. If you have a nice um, combination of different types of brush marks, it's another contrast that you as the artist can play with. And yeah, I think it's worth trying. You can overdo it, but I think a combination of clean edges and scruffy edges, lost edges and found edges, if you will, um, dry brush marks with more elegant calligraphy can be quite effective combined within the same painting. I'll go to one of my name brand Neath brushes for the 
some of this informal uh, landscaping that I've made up. One great thing about painting from your imagination is no one can look at it and say, that's wrong. That's not the way that window looks, or that's not the way this happens. Yeah, well, you can't tell me that because you, you weren't there because it doesn't exist. Um, what else? Oh, green. When I was learning watercolor years ago, like many old painters, which I guess I am one now, I think I was taught never to buy green pigments. I always mix them myself. That's fine. You can do that naturally. But I was teaching in Seattle at Daniel Smith, and I think I said out loud to the group that I never used green pigments. I don't know if my memory is perfect, but I think that was the first time I met John Cogley and he pulled me aside and said, I've got to teach you a few things about green pigments. And he did. So uh, long story short, I went home with a bag full of beautiful green pigments um, and I would never go back. So what I'm using primarily today are two greens, both by Daniel Smith, a serpentine green and a jadeite green. Why I like them is because they're very uh, sediment-based, meaning that when they, as they dry, they begin to, um, the minerals within the actual pigment float to the surface and you get this beautiful, luminescent, uh, shimmering effect that you're just not gonna get with any dye-based color. It's not possible, so. Uh, yeah, I could go on and on, but they're fantastic. I recommend them. They mix very well with other colors as well, so no problems there. I suppose while I'm shamelessly plugging materials, uh, I should mention my palette is made by Steve Finelli, House of Hoffman, who for me makes the best palettes on the planet. I say that and then people go to his website and faint because they are not cheap. But they are beautiful and fantastic. And anyway, I just have to give him credit for the artisanship and the work that he does. I don't expect anyone to go out and spend a fortune on a palette. It's not, it isn't practical for, well, probably for any of us, but. But if you ever find yourself with a little bit of money you can't get rid of, that's a good place. So what you uh, can probably see that I'm doing is I'm laying in some of the natural world elements, that is to say landscaping, the sky, atmosphere, and now some of the landscaping. Um, I'm doing a bit of negative shape painting here, not painting the elements of uh, architecture or man-made elements, but painting around them in a negative shaped way. I'm trying to paint quite fast because I know we have limited time and I was late getting here. But this is not at all dissimilar. It's similar to the way I would paint at home anyway. I don't work up my paintings with a lot of glazes and layers. I used to, as an architectural watercolorist, I did. I would spend as much as two weeks on a painting and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's fine. Um, certain techniques demand it. I think for me, I just got um, very weary of that, that style of painting for me. What I, what I came out with was not, not my best work. It looked very technical and not as expressive as I wanted. So I began to investigate trying to finish an entire painting in one sitting 
and to paint, I mean, there's no real benefit in painting fast, necessarily, but there can be some lessons you can learn. You can make quick decisions. You learn how to pace your uh, paintings and paint only what is necessary. You can learn how to not overwork your paintings, which I don't know for you, but for me can be a problem. If I have too much time, my paintings almost never end up looking better. They almost always end up looking worse. So for me, painting quickly, generally speaking, is a good idea. My large studio works that are a full sheet or larger, uh, they may take a day, sometimes two days, if I'm honest, but I don't spend any more time than that. Also, I'm very nervous and fidgety, and I lose, I lose focus. One thing I love about watercolor is its sense of immediacy and uh, um, the unpredictability of it. So when you do a painting all at once and you build in the knowledge that there are going to be mistakes and there are going to be things that happen that you didn't plan, that can be just magic. So I don't want to fight against that. I want to allow that. You can't create magic, but you can allow space for magic to happen. And we all have our unique ways, but for me, if I try to paint relatively quickly, that's the best way for me to allow that, those unexpected magical moments to happen. I stuck my hand in paint and smeared it on the bottom. That's, I guess that's an example of magic. Unexpected magic. Okay. Um, so you can see I'm jumping all around a bit in terms of values, but that's only because I have a pretty clear, uh, I have a pretty clear map of what I'm doing in terms of values. I paint always in three basic values, light, midtones, and darks. Within each of those, of course, there's a wide range of values, but I think one place we can go wrong as painters is if our paintings don't have a wide enough dynamic range of values. I jury a lot of shows, and I would say the one thing that keeps people out of shows is that there's not enough value range in their paintings. Juries can be lazy, uh, sleepy animals, so you have to wake them up with enough value range to catch their attention. Also, I just think the story of your painting, the narrative comes across much better if, uh, if you think about that. It doesn't mean you have to paint in pure white or pure black, but, but I do think you need a coherent value range. Another beautiful quality about watercolor is that I call it a subtractive medium which means the lightest light that we have to work with is obviously the white of the paper that's already painted for you. In my classes, I'll hold up a blank sheet of white paper and say, look, you're halfway done. Because it's true, all the white is there. All the light that you need in your painting to make it work is already there. It's very unlike oil painting or even acrylic where we paint in white or light pigments. So um, the beautiful white of the paper, it's one reason your paper choice makes such a difference. Uh, the Fabriano, the Bao Hong a little bit, but they're so white and bright that it just makes your job as a painter that much easier. So uh, I call watercolor a subtractive medium because since we start with 100% of the light already painted for us on the blank sheet of paper, 
All we do is subtract away that light by painting the shades and the shadows. Simple. I get asked a lot in interviews, how do you paint the light? And because I'm a bit of a smart ass, I say, well, I don't. I just paint the shadows. The light's already there. But that's true. So what I'm trying to do is maintain this crystalline bit of pure white along this imaginary horizon in the distance. Uh, and then grading uh, this water down a little bit to a mid-tone in the foreground. So, so far, as far as my value range, I have all the light lights, of course, are established. The saved white of the paper here, 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 little bits here, I'm toning that out a little before I'm done, and little bits up here. Um, and then the first thing I paint are the midtones. So the atmosphere in this case behind, the atmosphere, the natural world in the foreground there. Generally, I work my paintings up from the lightest light to the darkest dark. The darkest dark is going on last. And since I try to work my paintings up all at once, you have to sort of stage one area to the next so you can't go back in. I couldn't paint this until the background sky was dry enough, which it is. So I think I will start in on that now in the interest of time and get this moving. Um, not a rule, it's just a little thing I sometimes do. But if I do a painting that has the inclusion of uh, man-made elements and natural elements, sometimes I'll uh, assign a, um, a value range of colors one to the other, which means I might make the natural world dominantly cool tones and the man-made world dominantly warm tones. Um, there's a million exceptions to that, but it's just a little thing to think about, a game I like to play with myself. So the, uh, the undying architect in me has invented this crazy horizontal building suspended by these ancient ruins of uh, a mythical city behind, be, uh, beneath. And I'm just trying to find ways of joining the two together in uh, hopefully a surprising, but also hopefully an interesting and uh, successful way. The undersides of these projections is uh, another little thing I very often do, which is I dropped in some of this beautiful permanent orange into a sort of a basic wash of um, Van Dyke brown under to form shadow areas, shade areas, that is. And why I do that, I just think um, it's another area of contrast. Uh, a light tone illuminating a dark, but also because if you walk around a beautiful Italian city, for example, if you look up at the cornices and the undersides of bridges, they very often have a lot of light that bounces up off the street or off water to illuminate the undersides of um, structures or even trees or, or anything at all. I teach a whole lesson in luminous shadows in my course in which we talk about this at possibly boring length. But because I really believe as watercolorists, all we do is paint shadows, it's really worth our time to think about those shadows 
to think about the color, the tone, and the luminosity of the shadow areas that we paint. If we build in, if we think about them as luminous, mysterious, beautiful elements as opposed to just dark or depressing elements. Ah, poetry awaits, my friends. It's there. It all lives in the shadows. Um, I don't know if it's practical, but if anyone has questions, I am able to answer you while I'm painting. But if there's anything really urgent anybody wants to ask me, I'm happy to uh, accommodate. That's all right. What? Oh, <laughs> oh Pierre. My hero. Ah. A tutte. Mmm. A good choice, too. Thanks, Pierre. Um, I don't know if I recommend drinking and painting, but I think you all know there are some paintings you get halfway through and you just think, maybe it's time to go for a, a glass of wine now. Someone asked me recently if I ever did a bad painting. Oh my God, you clearly have not been to my studio. It's littered with bad paintings. But that's good, because how do you do a good one if you don't know what a bad one is? I do paint so much, and I paint fairly fast, so yeah, I have a lot of horrible paintings. I've been trying to move, and uh, I've had to go through many years of old paintings, and it's startling how bad some of them are. So they had to go. I just had dinner in New York with Joseph Zabukvik, and we were talking about bad paintings, <laughs> one of his favorite topics. And he said he recommends going through all of your work once a year and throwing out everything that's not good enough. And I said, well, if I did that, I wouldn't have anything left. So maybe every five years, but yes, he's a little brutal. Okay. Um, how are we on timing? Am I way over? Do I have a little while left? Does anyone know? I can, uh, I can stand here and paint all day. It's what I love to do. But uh, there are other important people. Despite all my chatting, I'm painting as fast as I can.
So slowly this thing is beginning to emerge. I think you could begin to see what I'm up to. Or not, but hopefully. I cannot tell you how much I love doing this kind of painting. It's really thrilling for me. Um, during the last year or so, I've probably done 30, 40 paintings of just completely imaginary um, landscapes, subjects, buildings, people. I've entered a few of these in various competitions, and I guess it's safe to say not all jurors are as fond of them as I am, but some are. You can't please everybody, huh? So uh, this imaginary rock face is coming down into the water here. Do I know what it really looks like? No, but I can just make it look like whatever I want. So I'm trying to make it look like um, a bit of a man-made structure is just crawling out of the a beautiful old rock face. And then, uh, in keeping with my constant theme of connection, I want to make sure that the reflections, the water, connect up to the, uh, to the structure and up to this hillside. So I got the answer for you, I just talked to Anna. Oh yeah. And you may go close to 2 o'clock. The next it's at 2 o'clock, so you have okay. 20, 25 minutes. I'm in good shape, thank you. And don't forget your best brush, your thumb, comes in very handy. <sighs> yeah, I really need to calm down. I honestly thought I wasn't going to find this place. So I have um, the idea up here of some sort of a modernist post-apocalyptic building. Really don't know. Doesn't matter, so I'll just give it some sort of a sense of identity. I can tell you, having been an architect for a thousand years, even real architects in real cities working on real projects don't know what the hell they're doing most of the time. So this really isn't that much different. My job as an architect was, I was a concept designer, which meant I just had to do drawings of 
buildings that may or may not ever exist as an attempt to inspire developers or people with money to, to fund them. So yes, there was a great deal of imagination and uh, wishful thinking going on. So the only difference is that now I'm my own client, so all I have to do is please myself, or in this case, you. And again, if anyone does have questions, I'm happy to uh, accommodate. Ah, uh, the question is, how do I decide to use warm or cool tones for shadows? Um, I don't think it has a necessarily a simple answer, but generally, I think if a shadow or a shade area is larger, I try to work in a combination of warm and cool. If the shadow area is very small and contained, probably I'll keep it more cool just because the area is smaller. And in that case, a smaller shadow, it's often more about the value than about the color. But a larger shade or a shadow can accommodate uh, a larger range of tonalities, so I will work in little bits of uh, cool and warm, which is probably not a good answer, but it's the truth. I'm sorry? Pre wet the paper? No, uh, I, I'm sorry? I never pre-wet the paper because if I do, well, if I do a big area of wet and wet, I will wet that whole area and just drop in color. But I don't pre-wet the whole paper first because you can never hold an edge or any such thing. Um, large pieces of paper, people ask me if I stretch them first. Uh, I do, but modern watercolor paper um, has different, uh, arguably better sizing than old paper, so it doesn't have a lot of those animal products. So stretching isn't quite as necessary as it once was back in the old days when I started. However, a large sheet, full sheet or larger, I will wet it on the back, let it sit, and then staple it down to a to a board before I begin. So I've done a number of this kind of painting recently, and my friends will look at it and say, oh my god, who would live there? I said, well, we don't know, do we? The way the world's going, who knows? I would be personally very delighted to live there, but it may not be for everyone. Oh, I think I started uh, 
a very brief lecture on my four design principles for a good painting. This I teach in my class, and again, these are not rules you have to follow, but just uh, the ones I follow. I think it's a good idea to have a plan for your paintings, an intention. So my very first design principle is to ask yourself, why are you doing this painting? What is it you want to do? Maybe it's enough to just say, it makes me happy, I feel like doing it. That is good enough, actually. But it might be worth it to ask yourself, why is that? What is it about painting that means so much to you that you have to do it? Uh, I love that question. I don't always have a good answer, but I love to ask myself. Uh, so I think your intention for your painting. Very often there's a story or a narrative. You know, not an explicit story like an editorial, but there's a narrative that you as an artist want to get across. For me, in this painting, it is really just a meditation on time, the passing of time, past, present, future, and how, the life, how life and how the world might change, how climates might change to make the world a very different place than we now know it, that sort of thing. That's my intention. Once you have your basic intention, then I think it's worth asking yourself, the second, my second principle is, once you have your intention, composition is the next word that comes to mind. How do you begin, before your brush ever touches the paper, how do you begin to think about how to arrange visual elements on your paper? Um, the very first question, generally, that comes to mind is format. Would your story be better told in a landscape or a portrait format? They're very different animals. I like both. I think the advantages of a vertical format is that it sex sets up a very specific energy reading this way through the painting. Very different than a painting that's horizontal. A landscape painting dominantly horizontal, it sets up a horizontal energy that's more ground-based. It tends to pull the viewer's eye and spirit through the painting from left to right or from right to left. A vertical painting tends to pull the viewer's eye up and down through the painting from bottom to top, top to bottom. By so doing, it sets up connections, the connection of earth and the heavens above. A landscape painting sets up the connection between left and right and uh, so each format is good, but each one, I think, is often a little more appropriate for the kind of story you're trying to tell. This one, I wanted it to be a little bit poetic, a little bit a story about time, passing of time, the connections between past and present and future. So I thought a vertical format would be a little bit more um, narrative, a little bit more successful in helping me get that story across. The third element I talk about is once you know your intent, once you have uh, the direction of your painting in mind, and once you begin to think about the composition, the format, etc., of the elements on the page, <clears throat> then you have to begin to think about the values. Um, as an art instructor, I probably use the word values more than any other word. Nothing is more important. Dark, light, midtones. We all love color. I love color. I can't go into an art supply store without an adult watching me because I want everything. But the truth is, to do a good painting you don't necessarily need that many colors. Sorry, John and Catherine. Well, you need the ones that work for you, but you don't necessarily need all of the ones in the store. It's values that sell the story. 
It's values that carry the narrative. It's values that uh, uh, get across your intent. Colors, for me, carry the emotional weight. Values carry the narrative weight. So last on my four element list is color. But color has to uh, serve the value structure of the painting. The value painting has to serve the composition. And the composition has to serve the intent, the overall story of your painting. So those four things, uh, you're welcome to steal them or borrow them or you're also welcome to ignore them or talk amongst yourselves and tell your friends what a hack I am. I'm, I'm happy. But those are the four things that run through my mind before I do any painting at all. I ask myself those four basic questions. All right. Getting there, gang. It's beginning to emerge. It looks as if I painted a lot of darks here, but I really haven't. These are just darker mid-tone values. The really deep darks are coming in just one moment. Actually, now is the moment. We're running out of time. Um, I want to finish off sort of with a, a deep foreground, some big columnar cypress trees um, to really set up the vertical nature of this painting and also to emphasize the, the natural world a little bit stronger to uh, complement, contrast the, uh, this fantastical architectural world. So to set this up, I'll drop in a few hints of these cypress trees in the background. For this, I'm just using a small uh, mop brush, not much water, a little bit of dry brush, just so I get some aerated um, scrape marks so they don't look too solid. They look, hopefully, look a little bit more like trees. And then, um, I hope this isn't off camera too badly. I had this um, system of metal wiring and uh, uprights to hold this whole imagined thing together. So I'm using a small little mop brush, almost like a rigger, to do some thinner, more delicate line work, which is just the beginning of the final stage, my very darkest darks. What I'm using for this is um, a Van Dyke brown, but just very, almost no water at all. I could even use a little neutral tint, just something that's very dark. Color in this case isn't very critical. It's just about the values. I'm not talking so I can paint faster. I get asked a lot, how do you paint and talk at the same time? Well, I don't know that I do either very well, but I try. 
try. I guess I think it's important for an artist that's doing a demo to try to explain why he or she's doing what they're doing so you have some idea of what's in their mind. Right. A couple of larger trees here in the foreground, and then um, the front bank, a little boat with a guy in it, and then we're done. Sounds easy enough. This is uh, some alizarin crimson mixed with jadeite green, which makes very, very beautiful dark, almost black, but not quite. So it's, whenever you want a dark, all you have to do is mix two complements, and you'll definitely get dark. The darker the root colors, the darker the uh, end result will be. But deep green, a Windsor green, perylene, anything, a jadeite green I like, mixed with a deep red alizarin or the like, will get you a very rich deep color. Even though it's about the value, the color is also important. Um, I drew a little creature here standing in a boat. I'll give him a little love. I mean, after all, he's the one that discovered this mythical island. Or was he? Because there's the mysterious woman in red standing up above. Maybe he wasn't the first after all. She's already there waiting. Hmm. Okay, uh, last things, I'm just going to add a little hint of reflection in the water. Uh, yep, it's pretty dry from the earlier wash I did, so it'll hold an edge if I need it to. Um, I think one of my self-criticisms is I've been guilty of overworking areas of water a bit too much and making them too busy. So I'm trying to 
keep them a little simpler. So for me, a little bit of a base tone and then a little bit of dry brush over perhaps is almost all that's ever needed. Something like that is good enough. And then this deep um, shadowed outcropping of rock in the foreground. One of my most important tools I forgot, my little mist bottle. Tragic, really. It's hard for me to do a painting without it, but I will persevere. So I've decided to give this guy a little red boat. I'm just gonna let all this bleed together, the foreground, the water, the front, the bank in the front, the boat, everything connected. If it looks a little mysterious, uh, that's good. That's sort of the theme of this painting. A little bit of mystery. I think it's just two o'clock, so there we go. So there we have our little mystical uh, mystery island with a meditation on the intersections of time. So uh, I know another um, speaker's coming up, so let me clear my things out of here. We'd like to thank so much Tom for the demo he did. As you could see, Tom is different because different is the way he is able to explain us what is the structure which is under the piece is working on and is able to speak in the same way he is giving the single strokes and he has been able to explain us all the strokes he did and uh, I insist to say that this is very rare because so many artists are, are not able to speak in the meanwhile they paint. Yeah. So this is a rare thing. But I would like to say that two years ago, more than two years yes. ago, Tom came one day in a place very close to Fabriano in the country. So beautiful. And there were so other, other mm -hmm. uh, big watercolorists with us. 
and uh, we left Tom alone in a place in the middle of the country, and he was able to paint plein air without saying a single word. It was difficult. <laughs> yeah, and it was difficult. Yeah. So we thank very much, Tom, which thank has you. been a pleasure for us. To have him again. Well, thank you, Gabriela. Thanks, everybody, for your attention, too, and thank you all for gathering. I know the world is a difficult place, and this is a, a beautiful moment where we're getting back to something like normal. Also, Otis wants to say hello.